I kind of go back a long time. I, this is back in my first pastor, but I, I just remember uh, meeting with my deacons uh, one evening and talking about outreach in our community. And one of the questions that uh, somebody asked was, well, who are the people that aren't in our church? I mean, we're a rural community and we had a, a decent sized congregation that, that seemed to have people from around various parts of the community. But obviously there were a few hundred people in the community that were not at our church. So who are the people exactly that are not in our church? And as they started talking, it became fairly easy for them to identify four groups of people. They said, well, um, we don't have anybody who's coming to our church who's on so social assistance. Um, and there are people on social assistance in this community. We don't have any truck drivers who come to our church. We have truck drivers' wives, but we have no truck drivers. And, you know, Dan Ross is like a mile from where we are. Um, we have no divorced people coming to our church. We have no single parents coming to our church. Again, this is the 1980s. Um, but fairly quickly, they were able to identify four groups of people. And then we began to think, well, why? What is it about our church that has said to some people, this is not a church for you? And what do we do to be able to begin to break down some of those barriers? So I'm guessing that your answers to those questions would be different if you think about your, your congregation. But I'd still like you to ask that question for a moment. As you think about your community, and then think about your congregation, how representative of your community is your congregation on Sunday morning? Or to put it in the negative way, who's missing in your church? Who are the people who, though they live in your community, never come to your church or are not part of your church community? And are there reasons, are there barriers that prevent them from becoming a part of your church community? We can think about the Bible, the ministry of Jesus, the uh, early disciples, and the ways in which some of those barriers were crossed. And we see it in a number of different ways. You know, we, we think of Zacchaeus, the wee little man, as we sang. And Jesus says to him, I'm going to your house today, you know, Get the meal ready. We're going to eat together. So somehow in that sharing of a meal, uh, Jesus saw an opportunity to reach out to this tax collector, this really outcast, with good news. Uh, we've all heard a dozen sermons probably about Matthew gathering his friends together and Jesus coming sort of as the guest of honor. But again, here is Jesus eating a meal, well, with tax collectors and sinners, to quote the Pharisees. Um, Jesus was crossing barriers that other religious people would not cross, and he was crossing those barriers through hospitality, through sharing together in a meal. Uh, one of the sort of saddest but in some ways funniest stories in the book of Acts is what happens when Peter goes to the home of Cornelius. And here is Cornelius and his, I mean, talk about an evangelist dream come true. You know, Peter arrives, here's Cornelius, he's got his friends, he's got his family, and basically he's saying to them, we're all ready to believe, you just tell us what we need to believe. And so they do. And what does Peter do that really sort of... Um, Again, breaks down the, the social wall. Peter has dinner with them. Now, when Peter goes back to the church, very excited to tell them what has happened, that even the, the Gentiles have become followers of Jesus. And, you know, they were baptized, and I stayed to eat with them. And the church people basically say, you did what? You, it, was, it was all right to let those Gentiles hear the gospel. But you ate with them. You sat at a table and ate with them. That, that suggested there is no barrier between Jew and Gentile. 
which of course is exactly right because of the gospel. But the people in Jerusalem are having a hard, the Christians in Jerusalem are having a hard time with that concept because a meal is something that we share in common regardless of who we are. Now in our churches, we've made hospitality into programs. And then they become programs that people tend to sort of look down on a little bit. How many times have you heard people say, oh yeah, what Baptists can always do well is eat. Well, the truth is I find that actually most people can eat. Okay, this is not a strange thing. We've programmed it. We've turned it into a supper. I, when I was doing my, my uh, um, surveys, my research in declining congregations, one of the things I found was that a number of those congregations would say, when I'd ask them about social ministries, they'd say, oh, yes, we provide meals for the poor. You know, once a week we, we, we open our doors, we have poor people come in, and they, you know, we feed them. And I'd say, oh, it's not, you know, that's nice. And I'd say, so, you know, how many volunteers does it take for you to do that? Oh, well, well actually, we don't do it. We get other people to come in and do it. We, we allow them to use our facility. Uh, in other words, they were giving money to feed people who were hungry, but they weren't getting their hands dirty. And in particular, they weren't getting to know any of those hungry people. I was at one church. They told me that they had just fed 151 people that week, uh, high school students who came once a week to their church for a meal. And when they brought that up, that it sort of turned into an argument within the group as to whether this was even worthwhile. Uh, one person said, you know, none of those young people started coming on a Sunday morning. And another person said, well, you know, I don't know if they even say grace when they come. And so it turned into this, and once again, it, it showed that actually in their minds they were giving food to feed high school stomachs. But no one was getting to know any of those high school people. And that is the point of hospitality, that when you sit down at a table and one of you is 90 and one of you is 9, you're doing something in common. Or one of you is Jew and one of you is Gentile. Or one of you is African and one of you is Canadian. Or one of you is any other distinction you want to make. You're sitting at the same table, and you're eating together. And in that common atmosphere, you can get to know each other. You can talk together, and you can even begin to talk about your spiritual journey. So, hospitality is not a program. That's, I think, one of the key things where we have, we have gone down the wrong track. And I think there are many churches that say, we have a hospitality program. We're feeding the poor, we're feeding high school students, we're, fe we're doing something. But actually, hospitality is about the interaction, the friendships that develop in that time when we're sharing in common the meal. Hospitality is not hospitality if it's programmed. It doesn't work if it's programmed, because when it becomes a program, it really ceases to be true hospitality. It becomes sort of charity. And I don't mean that in the good sense. I mean it's charity in the sense of we who know it all and have it all are providing for you who don't know anything and have nothing. That's not what hospitality is about, where we share together in common. So I think that's probably in many churches the most common form of hospitality, the care of the poor or the feeding of school students. But even there, it becomes a program too easily without true hospitality where lives are shared and friendships are formed. And once again, as I go back to that particular congregation, where it turns into a debate of whether this is worthwhile because none of those people are coming to church on Sunday morning. So let's think about some attitudes of hospitality. And what I'm, I'm going to do here, and I hope this is going to work, what I want to do is I want to focus on my experience, uh, I should say mine, but the experience of my wife and I, Rosalie and I, um, in um, providing hospitality to uh, international students who come to St. John, either to NBCC or to UNB. So for the last, I don't know how many years now, probably seven or eight years, we have um, been attempting to use our home and, and food 
as an opportunity to provide hospitality to people from um, China, Korea, Kazakhstan, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Brazil, um, and I don't know where else, but lots of India, uh, lots of parts of the world. And in particular, um, to offer hospitality to people who don't have a Christian background. So most of these people who come to us, uh, some are Christian, particularly the ones from Africa, but, uh, but most of them would be Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, Muslim, um, as opposed to being Christian. So what I'm hoping is that by using this example, as you, as you hear some of the principles that we've tried to follow, you will also begin to think, how could these principles be used to reach the group of people that we need to reach with our congregation? Because I think, I think many of these principles are transferable to reaching a generation of people who are not in your congregation or to reaching people who are secular, because those are cultural barriers too. I mean, there are generational cultures around us. And so if we have a generation missing, we have to do something cross-cultural. We have to break down a cultural barrier to be able to reach out to those people. And again, I think hospitality, no matter what age you are, I find you still like to eat. So that's one of the ways to break down that barrier. And, and I, again, I think a good biblical way to do that. Uh, similarly with secular people, that's a cultural barrier. It may be your next door neighbor, but it may be very, very difficult to share your life with that person in ways uh, other than inviting them to sit down at your table for a meal. So as I'm talking about people from other parts of the world, I'm hoping that you will be thinking about the age groups missing in your church, the secular neighbors that you have, or whatever groups of people you identify that are missing from your congregation but you think you would like to build bridges to in some way. So, the first element of hospitality is your own attitude. If you're thinking, well, we're going to be the good people, we're going to be stooping down to these other people whom we're going to be offering hospitality to, then please don't even start. Um, I can honestly say my wife and I have received far more, we have received far more from the people to whom we provide hospitality than we have ever given to them. And, um, and if, we go, if we go into this ministry with an attitude of superiority or something like that, um, it's not going to be genuine. Hospitality is a gift that flows in both directions as we share our lives around a common table. Um, it has been, I, I don't know how to describe it, I mean, I, I just know so much more about the world now than I ever would have otherwise because I've gotten to know people well from many countries around the world that I've never visited and never will visit. Uh, but it's, it's really been a gift to me. So it doesn't work, I believe at least, it doesn't work when one group is serving another. Because that ruins the commonness of the hospitality. It's something that is shared. The second thing I would say, and, and this I have seen as a real problem in, in some congregations, and that is somebody decides, um, this is going to be my ministry. It just can't be. It ha even if you are the only person doing it, it's so, I, I believe it is so important that you see it and the people who are sharing in this that you're inviting, that it's seen as your congregation's ministry. Um, it's about the witness of the church. And so it's a corporate ministry. It's not just your individual because I happen to like X group of people. It's because this is who we are as Christians. This is who we are as a church. So it's a corporate ministry. And the focus is the people whom we serve. So it's not about my ministry. It's our privilege. It's our privilege. It's not our task. It's our privilege. When God receives the glory, we receive the joy. That's a, a, an old Spurgeon quote, but I still love it. When God receives the glory, we receive the joy. Um, if we are doing this so that people will see how very hospitable we really are, more hospitable than they are, 
uh, God will not receive any glory, and frankly, we will receive no joy. The next thing, I just don't know how to say this any more bluntly than I'll say it. It is work. It takes time. It costs money. Because, because it's sharing your life. I remember uh, the phone ringing one morning on a day when I already had so much to do, I wasn't really sure how I was going to get it all done. And of course, it was all desperately important stuff. The phone rings a little bit before 9 o'clock in the morning, and it's, it's a student from Nigeria calling. And I don't have time to talk to him, really. And I'm trying to give him that clear impression that this should be a short conversation. Until I hear him say, well, and, I, and again, I, I've pretty much given the, the idea that I can't talk to him right now. And I hear him sort of saying, well, my brother just died. And so I'm thinking, oh, baby, I need to listen to this. And then I'm thinking, what am I going to have to do here? And it, it turns out that his 27-year-old brother in Nigeria had happened to drink some water and... Uh, he had uh, gotten typhoid and died, suddenly went to the hospital, which apparently didn't have antibiotics at the time, or, or the clinic didn't have antibiotics. Anyways, he died, 27. His brother is X number of thousands of miles away with no family support in Canada. Um, suddenly, all the important things I had to do that day um, had to be rearranged. Um, it takes work, it takes time, it costs money, uh, when we feed people meals, <laughs> um, it, it is work, it is time, it is money. It requires choices, it requires patience. So I'm just going to say, if you're not willing to work hard, if you won't give generously of your time, and if you won't spend any money, then you will not be very hospitable. So this is Christmas at our house this year. We actually had a small crowd. Um, last Easter, we had 54 show up. We thought we were going to have 30-some, and uh, some of them knew of other people who were spending Easter all by themselves and invited them to come too. So uh, we only had 27 for Christmas. And again, I'm just looking here. I see India. I see Ghana. I see Nigeria. I see Kazakhstan. I see Zimbabwe. I see China. Um, I think that's all I see in this photo. Um, but I certainly, as I look here, I see Muslim, I see Hindu, I see Sikh, uh, I see Buddhist. Um, so we have uh, an interesting group of people. Um, it's frankly no work. Well, I, I mean, the, the food is work. But getting people to come to our home is no work. Um, these are people who have come to Canada most of them not Christians. There are some of them here who are Christians, but most of them not Christians. And what we don't realize is that f Canada sort of stops at Christmas, um, and everybody's with family and doing something, um, and here you are as a Hindu or a Muslim in Canada. And there really isn't much going on for you. Um, we really don't do much in terms of promotion. I send out an email to a few people and say, if you know somebody, um, and they show up. And you don't, have to be, um, you don't have to be sort of the master chef either. So I'll just move ahead here. So if you can see here, this is Helen Breen. Helen Breen I was for many years a deacon in our church. She, at this point, I'm guessing was about 85. And uh, she called my wife one day and said, could I, could I have all the students come over to my place sometime? Well, we knew she didn't want 27, but we did uh, invite some to go to her place for lunch, and uh, she ordered in pizza. Um, pretty simple. Uh, but she had an amazing opportunity to be a witness to these people just by opening your home, talking with them, being hospitable, uh, seeking to learn from them, asking questions about their culture, about their religion, um, just sharing in hospitality. It was a tremendous afternoon, not only for all the students that went there and really appreciated it, but for her also as somebody who wanted to, uh, to do something to reach out to these students. Now, 
I'm going to tell you a little story here that uh, just shows how God works in funny ways or teaches, teaches us in funny ways. So one of the issues, of course, uh, my wife had made clear to Helen that um, we would have um, Hindus, Muslims, at least, coming, and so that would affect the dietary <laughs> requirements of the crowd. So Helen had listened to this, and she'd ordered pizza. And she ordered a variety of pizzas, which was a good thing, because some of the pizzas were fine. Some, some had no beef, some had no pork, so we were okay. But um, as the pizzas were cut and being brought, uh, served around to people, um, well, some did have pork, some did have beef. And so I was, I was just sitting beside two people, and I, I heard uh, one of the women turn to the guy beside her as he was reaching for a piece of pizza that clearly had bacon on it. And she says, that's, I heard a whisper, that's got bacon on it. And I heard him say, I know, and I want to know what it tastes like. <laughs> Which reminded me that we have our stereotypes, that somehow when somebody is Muslim and comes to Canada, they are like, you know, fanatical, fundamentalist. Every, you know, the truth is there are teenagers or early young adults who are wanting to find out things, and they're away from mom and dad, just like our kids are when they go away to school. So again, we need to, again, take down some of the barriers that we have put up and realize that some of these young people are really searching. If I go back to the, the previous slide, and I mentioned this uh, yesterday, but again, I just was sitting eating Christmas dinner beside uh, a young man from Asia who, who was Muslim. And he, be, he just began talking to me about his interest in finding out about other religion and in particular about Christianity. Um, I don't think I would have had that conversation in a church. But in my living room, while I was eating my turkey dinner and he was eating my, my turkey dinner, um, we, we had a great conversation there. Just, I mean, certainly I didn't lead him to the Lord, I don't to, but it was a planting opportunity. It was a beginning conversation about how he as a Muslim could begin finding out, asking questions about Christianity. So let's think about some elements that I think are important in terms of hospitality. And once again, I'm, I'm asking you, even though I'm talking about international students, I want you to be thinking about whatever groups of people you need to show hospitality to in your community to break down a barrier. So let's think, first of all, for people who are directly involved in providing hospitality. So, and I, I should go back and talk about some of the things that we do. I already mentioned that uh, uh, days like Christmas and Easter, sometimes Thanksgiving as well, and sometimes just out of the blue times of the year, we have people to our home uh, for, for a meal. Um, but another thing that we do that I think is really a key uh, element in this, and that is we uh, make sure that anyone who wants to come to church has a drive to church every Sunday. Uh, and these are young adults, so that means texting. Okay, It doesn't mean phoning them. It doesn't mean emailing them. They're not going to open an email. It means texting them. So every night, I, every, sorry, every Saturday morning, rather, every Saturday morning, uh, I text about, I think, about 25 or 30 uh, students uh, and just uh, tell them if they want to drive to either of our Sunday morning services to text me back. And then on su Saturday evening, um, and, I sh and my, meanwhile, my wife texts a, a group of people that we have who have agreed to drive uh, to see who can drive people, and then Saturday night, uh, we put our lists together, essentially. Um, I have a list of who wants to go to church. She has a list of who is available to drive people. We put people in cars, and then, uh, again, I text the students to say who will pick them up. She texts the drivers with their phone number in order to let them know uh, who they are to pick up the next day. So those are, are uh, sort of the two main pieces that allow us to have other opportunities to talk with people. So, um, it's important to have some cultural and religious awareness if you're directly involved. So that means not just uh, Rosalie and I, it also means people who may help us with one of those meals, it also means anyone who's driving for us. So food, as I've already emphasized, food will be, a key, food will be key to any ministry of hospitality. It is something we all share regardless of religious belief and practice. 
And again, I've already made fun of this comment. Everyone likes to eat. Christians like to eat together is what I say. When people say, you know, those Baptists like to eat, I say everyone likes to eat, but Christians like to eat together. That's a wonderful thing. So don't minimize the significance of the shared meal. It was key in Jesus' ministry. It was key in the early church community. And I think that uh, we have we have not, um, we, we have missed tremendous opportunities because we've, we have uh, sort of each gone to our own little house to have all of our meals or to McDonald's or wherever we go. Um, now, uh, food, though, can uh, be complex in terms of religious and cultural sensitivities. I already mentioned the, you know, the guy saying, I want to eat bacon and, you know, I want to see what it tastes like. Um, but there are a number of things in terms of religious and cultural sensitivities. Um, for, again, for us dealing with international students, most of it centers around um, either beef or pork. And so, uh, generally speaking, uh, so well, let me back up and say, the first thing is, um, if, we're having, if we're having 27 people over for supper, um, we make sure that we have a variety of dishes. So we don't say, because we have Muslims coming, we're not going to have any pork. Or because we're going to have Hindus coming, we're not going to have any beef. We don't say that. Um, but we do make sure that if somebody comes who's Muslim or Hindu, there are lots of food choices for them. And we clearly label. So again, this might sound silly, but it, I don't think it is. And it's really, really helpful. That every dish that's on the table has a, a, a place card in front of it that labels it. And if it has beef in it or has pork in it, it clearly says that on the label. It just makes everyone feel better. Now, um, and I, and, and I uh, started to talk about pork because normally at Christmas we would simply not have pork at all on the table. And so I'm able to announce that to people ahead of time. We usually do have hams at, at Easter, so I make that very clear to people that there is ham and it's clearly labeled. Um, and again, you, you may be thinking, if you're thinking generationally or whatever, you may be thinking everything from who's vegan or vegetarian to who's gluten-free or whatever. Again, those are things in terms of what bridges you want to build to what group of people that you need to think through. Um, food's an important thing, but we need to make sure that we think about some of those complexities. Uh, I put down alcohol here just because, once again, um, this is a stereo. This is really a, a caricature, and I shouldn't say that. But I think a lot of Muslims coming to Canada think, well, Christians just drink a lot, and so um, I do try to make clear to people uh, when there are Muslims there. I'll just say there's nothing here with alcohol in it, uh, and honestly, you just see the relief in their faces because they're afraid of coming to a Christian home because they think there's going to be alcohol. So again, thinking through those things, um, I've put down freedom here from Western cult customs. Um, we expect people to eat the way that we eat. Um, not everybody in the world eats the way that we eat. Are we willing to, are, are we willing to find out what that means in terms of helping them to feel welcome? Um, and again, this can be in a number of ways. Um, so I think of uh, when I was pastor at Main Street Baptist and uh, we wanted to reach out to the families in the north end of St. John. And um, so we, 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 our primetime ministry on Sunday afternoon, sort of an afternoon Sunday school with a, a meal for everyone afterwards. Um, we, well, the meal as we started out was really quite disastrous because I mean, we were serving meals, as we always serve meals at church. We put down plates and knives and forks and spoons and napkins and whatever else. And we had children from our neighborhood who sat down at the table and, quite honestly, had no idea what to do. Um, for them, getting a meal meant going to get whatever was in the fridge. Uh, the idea of sitting down at a table with a knife. So we had to teach some things. We also had to realize that we were doing what I had talked about at the beginning. That was we were just providing food for empty stomachs. And we realized we had to have people from our church sitting at every table with those kids so that it was sort of a family atmosphere where people were sharing together at the table, not just eating food. And then when we opened the Hope Mission, uh, that continued. We realized that if this is just about people coming in, sitting at a table, and we feed them, it's accomplishing very little. 
We need people from our church sitting at every table getting to know these people, talking with them, becoming friends with them. So all of those things around food that are important. So again, I've said signs can be helpful, telling people. I mean, people from other parts of the world, uh, first time we served turkey, I suddenly realized, I guess everyone in the world doesn't eat turkey. Um, gravy. Even explaining to people what gravy was, I could see the look of utter disgust. You know, sort of the juices out of the bird. You know, that, I mean, they just... Um, so again, helping people to understand and making sure there are good options. Um, one of the things that we were too... We were slow to learn, but did learn... Realizing and explaining cultural differences regarding time. Um, we have our expectations as Canadians in terms of time. So, um, so again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a driver who uh, was supposed to go and pick up a student. It was a student from Africa. And I had realized this, but I had not thought to tell anybody else. So, you know, we had, we had told the student, this person will be there to pick you up at 1045. I don't know what time it was. I say 1045. The driver arrived, being a good Canadian. And where's the student? Not there. So he texts the student. I'm here waiting. Where are you? I'll be down shortly. Well, shortly to the Canadian is like within the next 30 seconds. So he waited another couple of minutes, and then he left. Because to him, if you're not ready to go when I get there, that's a problem. But actually, we've discovered that and talked with folks from that particular country who have made very clear to us that actually, in their cultural context, if you're waiting for someone they, when they come to pick you up, that is rude. That's suggesting that you are being impatient and that they should have gotten there earlier. So by staying up in the apartment until the person arrives and texts, that's the way they're responding. On the other hand, one of these mornings when it was like 20 below, I was picking up a student from China. And when I arrived to pick him up at the exact time when I'd said I'd be there, he was out standing by the street. And I'm thinking, I, I mean, I said to him, what are you doing standing on this? Oh, he says, I've been out here for 15 minutes. Because for him from China to be late would be a terrible insult. So we had to first beg him not to come out, which he never stopped doing, but he didn't come out quite as early. But we also then had to say to all of our drivers, when you're going to pick up these Chinese students on cold mornings, be there five minutes early because they're going to be already outside waiting. So again, just learning some of those cultural differences regarding time. Who waits for who? Um, church expectations. Um, again, one of the things that, that uh, culturally, um, realizing that some people find our casual dress at church to be unholy, I don't know if that's the right word. Um, and again, I'm not even talking about Christians. I'm talking about people who are not Christians, but who come from their cultural background and can't understand why people would come to a church dressed the way that we dress. So helping to explain some of these things. Um, social expectations. The Brazilians like to hug, just to warn you, okay? Um, whereas we went through a very uh, difficult time. Uh, you remember the SARS episode in Ontario? And uh, the Chinese folk almost pulled away from us because they were afraid that we would not want to shake hands with them. So again, we had to work through some of those things. Important to, to work through some of those cultural differences. So think about that in terms of whatever group you're thinking about. Again, it may not be the same cultural things, but think about it if it's a generational group or a, a group in your community that you're not reaching. What are the culture and religious awarenesses uh, for those directly involved in providing hospitality? 
I think that uh, we have to know something about the people we're trying to be hospitable to. Um, so what are some basic beliefs of other religious groups or secular people? Um, you know, again, I'll just go back to talk about Muslims for a minute. Um, one of the greatest reliefs for me, because I knew that we had, uh, we had people in, I guess, I, again, this uh, I'm sure isn't well said, but I want to say people of various levels of intensity in terms of their, their Islamic beliefs and their, um, and their following of the food um, laws. But to discover that um, no matter who they were as Muslims, fish is always fine. As one Muslim said to me, you can't tell if the fish was facing Mecca when they caught it. <laughs> um, that was very freeing and suddenly we realized we have to have fish at every meal whenever we have Muslims. Uh, we, we had other things that we thought most Muslims would eat, but nevertheless some very strict Muslims might not. Uh, but nevertheless, if we had fish, we knew that we always had a meat for Muslims. Um, our rule has been to always allow the guests to, the be, to be the majority in the room. In other words, if we're having a gathering, we make sure that more than half of them are not Christian. So we normally would invite some other Christian folk to be there. I mean, they help us with the hospitality. We want them to get to know people as well. But we try to make sure that, you know, again, if we have 27 people in our home, that, that probably no more than 10 of them at the most would be Christian. Um, learn together about one another's families, cultures, traditions, and geography. We always have a big map, or actually a globe, uh, that we use. Uh, if somebody comes who's from a different place than we have had before, to show us where, where their country is or where in their country their particular city is, um, and that actually usually leads to an animated conversation where they begin talking about their home, their family, their upbringing, their school. We learn lots of things just by having a map or having a globe that they have as a reference point to be able to tell us about it. It's, like, it's sort of like they ha this allows show and tell because they have something to point to to tell us about their home. And I would say... Um, Don't regard people or their foods or their dress as exotic. And what I mean by that is, you know, wow, you know, people around here don't dress like that. Um, we need to welcome them as, as we welcome, as we want to be welcomed ourselves. And that generally, I don't generally like to be made into a spectacle. Um, and neither do other people. Um, I don't know if you can see the numbers there to write them down, but there are two online videos th that are quite funny, but I think helpful. So this is, the, uh, this is the Morgan Spurlock series of a few years ago, 30 Days. So uh, they, they take someone and for 30 days they make them do something that they've never done before. So. Uh, these two I just think are helpful. The first is called Atheist and Christian. So it's a woman who's an atheist and they plop her down for 30 days to live with a Christian family uh, in Texas. Um, you, will see, you will see yourself in some of what uh, is shown probably. You will cringe at yourself perhaps but it will do it in a way that isn't humorous enough that hopefully you will learn from it. Similarly, um, the, the, with the Muslim and Christian, it's actually the Christian that they take, uh, he's actually a Roman Catholic man, that they take from, I think it's West Virginia, and they have him stay in a Muslim home in Michigan, Dearborn, Michigan, I guess, being the most Muslim city in the United States. So they uh, have him stay for 30 days in a Muslim home. <laughs> And once again, um, it's an opportunity for you to think about what stereotypes do you have about Muslims? And how do you understand how Muslims are treated in our society? Because that was one of the things that happened with him. They made him dress as a Muslim. And so as he was out on the street, people assumed that he was a Muslim too. And suddenly he began to be treated the way that Muslims are treated. And uh, it was quite a shock to him to realize that. So again, those are just helpful things in terms of understanding a bit of uh, uh, how, to, how to know what's going on in the minds and hearts of the people to whom we're trying to be hospitable 
in building these bridges. Now, for people in the church who are not as directly involved, but I still think important, there needs to be some gentle teaching is what I would say. So, again, I, I've just put one example up here. I could have talked about Africans. I took, could have talked about Brazilians, but I've put. All Asians are not Chinese. All Asians are not rich. All Asians are not from Asia. All Asians do not prefer spicy foods. In other words, I have been embarrassed by people who um, didn't understand things that we should have been careful to teach in the church. Uh, again, all Asians are not Chinese. For example, the Chinese New Year. But we actually discovered that we had quite a few Koreans in the congregation who didn't call it the Chinese New Year. Um, so we stopped using it. Now, for the Chinese people, it was Chinese New Year, no question. But we wanted to be able to celebrate with all of the folks from Asia. Some of the folks in our church had this idea, well, the only people who are coming to St. John must be people who are very rich to come here. When I knew very well that that was not the case. In fact, we had people who came to St. John who, uh, we had students who came who told me that basically um, their parents had spent every cent that they had to, be able to get their child to come to St. John to be able to go to university in Canada. Um, <laughs> Some folks at our church would just go up to somebody, and again, this could be from Asia, from Africa, from wherever, and say, you know, so you're from China, are you? Or you're from uh, wherever? And they would say, well, no, I'm from Toronto. Because um, there may be second, third generation Canadian. So we need to, again, alert people to the fact that um, a lot of Canadians are not white. So again, similarly for Africans, for Latinos, Latinas, what stereotypes need to be addressed? How can we teach people in the church so that we don't put up an additional barrier of our misunderstanding before we begin to reach out in hospitality to people? Um, I put down, what about interviewing someone from a different cultural heritage occasionally? Uh, and I've, I've put cultural heritage, Again, it may be you need to interview somebody who's from that generation group that's missing in your church, or whatever it is. But I think of uh, the week, a week ago Sunday. Um, I, I just thought it was really neat when uh, one of the Chinese young men in our church, uh, Vincent Zhao, uh, was interviewed by one of the pastors about uh, New Year. And he talked about his uh, bring, being brought up in China and how it was celebrated. And then as he began to talk about how difficult it is for people uh, to be in Canada and thinking about their families back in China and how far they are from their families. And as he said, like, this for us is like Christmas. It's a time when we'd always be with our extended family and we can't be with our extended family here. And I just looked around, I was, I was thinking, like, people are getting this and realizing this is, this is something that, well, it's like Christmas for us. So how important it was that wouldn't have come across by just telling our church people that. But it was having somebody who was being interviewed who shared about his own life and his own experience. I mean, for us, I think, uh, again, I wouldn't have realized how significant it was to put up signs in other languages, but to have, you know, restrooms, uh, nursery, welcome in, in Mandarin. Uh, one of the things that we do, and again, this takes no work, although people seem to think, people who come to our church think, you know, how do you do that? It's no work. Um, whenever we use scripture in the service, we put scripture up in four languages on the screen. And you're thinking, well, how do you get people to do that? And we don't. Um, you just go on Bible Gateway. You pick whichever language Bible you want, and you pick the chapter and the verse that you want on the screen. So every week we have Mandarin, we have Korean, we have Portuguese, and we have Arabic on our screen uh, whenever scripture is being read. Um, it takes, I mean, I preach maybe once or twice a year at our church. It probably takes an extra 10 minutes. 
to cut and paste those verses and put it up on the screen. And then I'll just say, English-speaking white Canadians... Oh, and I want to go back and say one thing about that too. Uh, in terms of putting it on the worship slides, uh, we're putting on the, uh, the slides, the uh, screen, it amazes me how many times if somebody comes who's new to our church, their first Sunday coming to our church, as soon as, and again, it usually doesn't happen until the sermon has started, so it's well into the service, but scripture will come, on, come up on the screen, and out come the cell phones of people who are there for the first time to take a picture of it because I have discovered what they're doing is they are immediately sending that back to their family in whatever country saying, look, I found a church that welcomes me. Um, that's how significant they see it being. I've just put down here, English-speaking white Canadians are not the only people qualified for church leadership. In, in its ministry, in terms of our service, or in mission, in terms of leadership. So I think we need to think about ways to privilege people from other cultural backgrounds in our congregations. So if we're going to, um, if we're going to be reaching, uh, let's say, uh, new Canadians who are Chinese, and they may uh, have Buddhist background, Chinese traditional religion, uh, but, but they're coming. Um, I think one of the most important things for them to see in order to think that the gospel is for them, is that we have leaders in our church who are Mandarin speaking. Um, and so it's been important for us to have people who are Mandarin speaking on our boards, to have people who are African on our board, uh, to have people from India on our board. Um, sometimes it's been a bit of a, uh, uh, how do I put this? Sometimes we had to put people who are very new Christians. So uh, when we start out with Chinese people in our church, nearly all of them were brand new Christians that had just been baptized. And yet we said we have to put some of these people on our board right away because we want people to know that this is not a white church that's letting Chinese people come. This is a church where we're all together uh, as people who are part of the body of Christ. So. How do we privilege people from other cultural backgrounds in our congregations? All right, so I've talked a bit about elements of hospitality, sharing meals, and friendship. Um, I've already talked about the fact that um, because we've had so many people in our home, because we have driven so many people to church, because we've gotten to know people, um, we're often the first people that are contacted when there's a tragedy, uh, when there's a problem, when there's sickness. Um, what a privilege that is, really. Um, I think back to a funeral that we had when we had a young Chinese man who was killed in a car accident. And really, um, I think most of the Chinese community in St. John came to the service. And what a privilege it was to be able to uh, well, even to show hospitality to them in terms of the, the church uh, providing a, a meal after the service and so on. But, but uh, ways in which we were able to show our care for people in times of deep need. And I guess I've got that down below, so I've gone ahead of myself. But sharing meals and friendship uh, really leads to uh, tremendous opportunities. Um, sharing transportation, I've, I've already, I think, given you enough of the nuts and bolts there, but but let's, I'll, I'll, back, I'll step back and say one thing here. In terms of transportation, um, what we don't want is taxi drivers. Because that, once again, is we who have the car serving you poor people who don't have a car. And that's fairly useless, to be honest. They could, we could, we could just hire a taxi to go and pay for it. I mean, it'd be about as useful. What we want is people who will provide transportation because they care about these people and they see it as a ministry and they see it as a, as a privilege and an opportunity. So if you have somebody who's going to say, well, you know, I guess I could do this once a month because you have to have people to do it. You get them here, don't you? Then just say gently, well, really, probably we can find somebody else. What you want is somebody who will care about these people. Uh, one of the great things, I mean, one of the great things is seeing someone who 
is a bit ambivalent about this ministry. And then just sort of casually talking to them, they start saying, oh, we had three or four students over to our house for dinner last week. Um, why'd you do that? Well, well, because do you, do you realize how interesting, you know, their lives are? And they're telling us about their home back in Africa and whatever. And suddenly you realize these people have begun to love these students. And they care about whether they know Jesus and they want to share the gospel and they're trying to do it through hospitality and through sharing their lives. And that probably wasn't what they were going to do when they first told us, yes, they would help with transportation. Um, so tra sharing transportation, but, but not taxi service. Again, it's a ministry of hospitality where we want to get to know these people and let them get to know us and hopefully come to our homes and see how as Christians we live. Uh, sometimes it's, it's uh, more in-depth. So our church has sponsored over the last, uh, whatever, three years or so, five refugee families, I guess. And uh, that it's been really important in those cases where people, um, I guess I'd almost say unexpectedly arrived in Canada, um, to be able to help them to understand our culture, but to do that, again, in a way that doesn't suggest our superiority, where as we're telling them about our culture, we are asking them to tell us about their culture so that we better understand them as well. I'll put down sharing space. So again, whatever group you're thinking of, is there some way that you can use your building? So uh, we can't do this anymore just because the group has grown too much in St. John, but um, for several years, the Chinese cultural community had their annual gala, New Year, in our building. And it was pretty exciting, I'll tell you, to have the, see the place packed with people uh, who now knew what it was to be inside our building and they saw that we had signage up in Mandarin and so on uh, that I think then made it easier to invite them back. So again, think about ways in which your building might be used as a shared space. Uh, there are other organizations that we've allowed to come in that somebody in our church has been a part of, in a sense, to be able to say, you can use our space that allows them to come into our building and have a sense of, of being more at home there. And I already talked about sharing in life's difficult moments, uh, just the number of times now that we've had people who have, uh, you know, just been homesick, to be quite honest, and needed to come to our house for an evening to have a meal. Um, you know, this is not a time we invite a whole bunch of people. <laughs> this may be just having one person come that we know is having a rough time and spend the evening with us and just talk and have fun and get a sense that even though they're a few thousand miles from the family, um, they have people who care about them here as well. So that's pretty well what I want to talk about here um, in terms of uh, hospitality, and, I, and so I'm going to let you ask some questions for a while. But I want to go back to what I started out with. And thinking about our secular, cult secular culture and the generational cultures around us that may be missing from our congregations. How can we use the same understanding and the same intentionality to cross cultural divides within our Canadian, pardon me, within our Canadian cultural context? So again, whether it's generational cultures, um, so are, have you been thinking about are there age groups missing in your congregation? How could you use hospitality, an intentional hospitality, uh, to, to cross that divide, to that age group? Or what about people who um, just seem to be completely uninterested in church? And that's probably because they are completely uninterested in church. But they probably still eat. How are ways that you could share a meal with them? or with several of your neighbors, perhaps even, in a way that would allow you to get to know them and them get to know you so that at some point, you could build a bridge that would allow you to share the good news of Jesus. Do we think about sharing in similar ways to reach people in our communities who are missing from church? So I think I'll stop there for right now and see if you have any questions or things you wanted to discuss or argue about. Any comments you want to make or questions you want to ask? Sure, do we, do we want this from the microphone still? No. Okay, good. Former church. 
Chinese student at Mount Allison University. And she wrote to them and she said, you know, uh, Professor Steve, you probably don't remember me, but you had me in your home 12 years ago. Yeah. And this is my first year to be a Christ, uh, uh, to come to Christmas as a baptized believer. Yeah, wow. Thanks. I just want you to unpack one thing, if you would. Because at the beginning, and I know, I think what you mean, but I'd like you to say about it. When you said it can't be a program. Right. But then you talk about, in a sense, a ministry of the church driving international students. And out of that formalized program, if you will, it, faced a plat it formed a platform for relationships to develop in these drivers to invite these people into yep. their own. There is structure, absolutely, yes. But I guess maybe, I've, maybe I think of the word program too negatively. But when I think program, I think, you know, let's sign up people to get drives and so on. Uh, and let's sign up people to have people at their house for dinner. Um, we need to find people who will love those people. And it has to be genuine. Now, that's true, I suppose, in any other. I mean, you could have Sunday school teachers who are teaching Sunday school because, well, somebody's got to do it. I hate these kids, but here I am, you know, because I'm a good, committed Christian. Uh, that would be probably very good either. So that's, I guess, what I'm thinking in terms of program. What I'm saying is we need to be hospitable because we really love people. And we, and we, we, want, to, we want to get to know them. We, we genuinely care about them. We are interested in them. Yeah, it has to be genuine, I guess is what I'm saying. So maybe I didn't phrase it as well as I could have. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that, actually. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll just go back and say, you know, really, what is better than, so about a year ago, this week probably, just about, um, I was in the baptistry, and I mean, I'm not a pastor anymore, but I got to be in the baptistry again, because um, we had a young man who, the previous, like a year and two months before that, Christmas, came to her home for Christmas dinner, and uh, just, I, I had said to a Chinese couple in our church, do you know of any students who have no place to go at Christmas? And they gave me this fellow's name and we texted him and he said, yes, he wanted to come. And then we started driving him to church every week and I just, one Sunday I opened the door to, for him to get in the car and when he got in the car, he turned to me and he said, I just want you to know I decided to follow Jesus this week. <gasps> and he'd never, I mean, he'd never been to church before in his life, before, that Christmas. Um, what's better than that, folks? Like, really, what's better than that? Uh, to be in the baptistry with him? Um, pretty exciting. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I don't think this is going to be an embarrassing question for you, knowing you as I do, but you started out by talking about the uh, uh, church milieu that most of us are in, rural church, and identifying single moms. And right, right. In that first church, yeah. um, we started having a men's breakfast on Saturday. So we realized that the truck drivers were all leaving on Sunday morning early. So that was one of our issues. We had a, we had a timing problem. And so we, we decided they, most of them did get home on Fridays. So Saturday morning, we started having a men's breakfast and inviting some of those men to come. And, and there are men that we knew, no matter what happened, if they became Christians, they're probably still not going to come on Sunday morning because they're heading off in the truck to go to Toronto or New York or wherever. So that became a means to begin to reach out to those people. Um, in terms of um, people who are single parents, I guess I'd speak of particularly because that's what comes to mind. It's not been yesterday. Um, I think we, ha we just intentionally had to start getting to know people. Now again, thankfully we were in a small rural community where, and it was still the 80s, the general store was still a major gathering place. And so we just had to start being intentional when we were in the store to introduce ourselves to people, say, I think you live down in the such and such house, and I'm so and so. And we did start seeing people come, mostly from inviting their kids to Sunday school, but the mother would come with them usually. Um, I don't think we did, not, did very well in terms of people on social assistance. That's my memory. I don't think we did much there. Um, so that's a quick answer, I guess. Okay. I'm just thinking, you know, in, in, in a rural context where everybody's family, everybody's living in the neighborhood yeah. forever, yeah. Uh, you can't get away with programs, really. 
Right, right. Yeah, and, it, yeah. And, and, and let me just say, I would have done things differently now. I do, st I do think that if I were there now and then was now, <laughs> I, would, I would have used hospitality. I think that I, I think we missed out on opportunities. I think if we'd invited people into our homes, um, it would have been an effect, um, certainly more effective than anything we did. I think the men's breakfast was a good idea. I think a better idea would have been to actually invite people into our homes. And, and, and what would have that looked like? I don't know. I don't know. I, once again, yeah, because it I mean, just... No, it is not. That's right. And I go back to what I said. I would want them to be in the majority, but I wouldn't want it to be just us. I'd want to have it as a group of people so that we are meeting one another. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but I, st I still think hospitality is a powerful thing. And, and, and one of the things I'd say, too, is it's more powerful today than it was in 1980 because most people never go into somebody else's home. I mean, really, most people... Who lets anybody into their home, you know? I mean, close the door, lock it, uh, you know, because we haven't cleaned it this week. Um, and, and how many people even prepare a meal, you know, that, re I mean, you know, order in pizza. I mean, let's head out to whatever, a Boston pizza. Or, you know, so, which means that because it is less culturally common for people to be invited to another person's home, it seems even more of a privilege or an honor that you're extending to them to say, we, we would like you to come to share a meal with us. I, I, I'll just put a thing too much time. A after uh, Sunday's sermon, because I'm such an awesome preacher, uh, this lady came up and said, I just, I, I'd like to somehow make our home open and just, I have this dream of people just sort of coming I remember, those are the dreams we have, right? right. I remember years ago, there was a book, I'm trying to think of the title of it, How to Build a Caring, Sharing Fellowship, I think it was the title of the book. Again, we're talking 1980s probably. But, um, but this was a pastor who was trying to figure out how to get the church to be hospitable. And so, what so he really was encouraging people to open their homes and invite people to come. And he said that, generally speaking, the people who had big homes and who sort of were the, you know, clean freaks, uh, they were the first people on board. So, yes, you know, we've got this big house. Uh, you know, the housekeeper comes in every Friday. Uh, you know, we can, have, we can have company as long as you don't make too much of a mess. So, um, and he said it was deadly. You know, people go to those homes and, you know, you hardly feel like you should sit on any of those chairs, you know, sort of. Um, but he said when people in a small apartment or in a mobile home invited people, people went and had a whale of a time. Yeah, because they, you know, it was, especially said if they invited enough people that there weren't enough chairs for everybody. And so people had to stand. And when you're standing, you, you start talking to people, especially you've got food in your hand. So you start talking to people. And it turned out, so it's sort of the opposite of what he expected. He was looking for, you know, people with the really nice homes, you know, just going to waste to be more hospitable. And it turned out, actually, that it was the people who were just ordinary folks. Um, I'll just throw one more thing into that. You know from experience where it's when you invite people for supper, and then you let them help cook supper. Yeah, uh, yeah. Works. Yeah, that goes back to what I said earlier about making sure that it, the sharing is both ways. Right. When they say, can we bring something, we say, yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah, and can you, could you bring something from your culture? Yeah. And honestly, sometimes it's really not what I want to eat. I'll just be blunt. I'm, I'm pretty, my mother was a wonderful cook, and yeah. So, uh, but I do want to eat it in the sense of sharing with them their culture and, and me understanding the foods that are important to them. So that's been really helpful for me, I think. Yeah, so, and, and it, it does level the field once again, yeah. And, and, uh, and let me just say another thing, too, sorry. But let me say another thing. If we're thinking, well, this is going to be my chance to, to share the good news of Jesus, which I hope it is, it's also meant having to, I shouldn't say having to, it's also meant listening 
do people tell me about their faith? That's right, exactly. Uh, now the truth is that they, most, most religious groups don't have the same evangelistic imperative that Christianity does. But nevertheless, they, uh, I mean, it's, it's been enriching to hear uh, people talk about how meaningful certain religious rituals are or about, uh, you know, the relative in their family who is the religious leader in their town or whatever. Um, that's great to know about them and to have a sense that I understand them and their family better. So, um, so in every way, I think we need to be willing to learn and listen uh, if, we, if we are looking for the opportunity to be able to share our news as well. So back at the back first. Yeah, 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 good, 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 good. Kevin? I, I don't think it's risk. I think if your heart is right, people will be pretty gracious and forgiving. So, I mean, I would say we made, we made mistakes from time to time um, and learn from them, but I think people are pretty gracious. I think that, um, although I think over time, over time, I'd say people have become more and more comfortable with inviting their friends to come to our home. And by friends, I mean their friends who are not Christians, or particularly friends who are of another religion. I think that people are more and more um, comfortable doing that because they know that, well, again, that we, we've just learned some things through the years. But I, I think we probably made serious mistakes when we first started, and nobody ran from the house screaming. Uh, I think they just knew that we were stupid Christians and didn't know better. And, you know, as long as we didn't keep doing it, I think it was okay. Um, so I don't know if that's what you mean in terms of risk. Well, I think in terms of the spontaneous nature, of it, like all this seems like pre-planned, right? A lot of this hospitality that you're talking about. Um, the driving, uh, the, the, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't want to give you the sense for, for that glad for, like Christmas, 
I mean, honestly, we thought we were going to have a small crowd. We thought, we thought maybe 10 people. Um, so I, I don't know what you mean by planned. Our plan for Christmas was to have a few, was to have people in for dinner. And it just ended up by the time they all, like, I mean, I'll give you an example. One fellow who's Christian, uh, whom we invited. Um, so, I mean, uh, well, we're both in the kitchen. We're both cooking. And supper's at 5, and the phone rings at 3, or no, it wasn't even, it, it was a text. I got a text at 3.30. Um, I've invited three of my friends to come. Um, and, and at that point, I mean, I wrote back to him and I said, like, uh, I can't get any more drives. Can you get here, you know, on your own? He said, yes, we'll get a taxi then. Because, uh, I mean, we were both cooking and all the people we had for drivers were already driving. So he actually ended up bringing five people when the taxi arrived. There were five, uh, four Hindus and one Muslim that he had just decided to invite. So that still sounds pretty spontaneous to me, I guess I'm saying. Right, right. Right. There's yeah. That, right. But I mean, certainly, for example, I mean, again, last last Easter when we ended up with more than fifty, um, we knew that we had to get friends to help with food, so we called other couples in the church and said you know, will you please make a casserole or whatever, because at that point we thought we were going to have 30-something. Uh, so, and actually Saturday night I headed down to Sobeys and bought a second turkey uh, that we plopped in the oven overnight. So again, because uh, it, was, it was appearing then we might have 40 uh, who would come. Um, so there's a little planning there certainly. I don't want to give the, in, the impression that, you know, people walk in the door and we think, oh, you know, start the, turn the stove on, we'll start cooking something. Uh, we, we know that well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just this morning, ju just a comment and also in the conversation piece. Um, this morning when we were having breakfast, Chris was sitting opposite to me. That's trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he asked me, um, I was mentioning something about body gesture and all that. And I... They always bore at me because when I'm talking to them, they don't look at me. They, they, they look down, you know, somewhere else. I said, that's a lot of Asian, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, even Middle Eastern. It is how they were taught. When we raise up our kids here, look at me when I'm talking to them. <laughs> right. This is why we program our kids to do. But in Asian culture, Chinese, etc. For a professor or somebody who has a high SOT standing, talking to them, out of respect, they will not look at them because staring at your superior, your professor, your whatever, you're challenging them. It is a disrespect. So I said, no, no, Chris, they, they, they are listening. They, they, it is just how they show respect. So in, in, when you're talking about Having a conversation, um, great, <laughs> but they may not look at you. Right, right. So it, it's just how culturally this is how they're programmed. So yeah. just, just a reminder. Yeah, yeah, good, good, yeah, good. And again, I want to go back to what I said earlier, and that is to think not just in terms of sort of different geographic cultures, but to think about your community. Who are the, who are the people in your community that, that there are barriers between you and them? and what you need to know about them in order that you will be able to start lowering that barrier. See, kind of, in your experience, do you find, like, who are the people, generationally, who are the people who are willing to be the host? Who, do you see any difference generationally in that? And I have a bit of a, 
question mark on that one because my experience is growing in that I think of my son who's now 32, that a lot of his peers are not necessarily asking their friends home. They might ask them out. Right, right. They're not going to ask them home. <coughs> right. Home doesn't have the same open door. And in that discussion, I get this kind of like, well, everybody's busy, right. and if you want to stay home, we're going to stay home with the kids. Like not right, right, yeah. So I'm just, in your experience, what did you think? So, I mean, I agree with that. I, but I would go back to what I said earlier, though. I think that that actually makes it all the more meaningful if they do invite someone to their home. So I think that, um, I think that for a 30-year-old or 35-year-old or whatever to invite someone to their home today means much more than it did when I was 35 to invite somebody. To, so so it's, it's more difficult and it's less common. It's very, in fact, it's very uncommon. Uh, but, but if it happens, it's much more meaningful. I don't know. It might be babysitting. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I, th I think part of it is helping them to, to realize that we understand that this would be, you know, I go back to what I said at the beginning, it, it, it is work. Uh, but we, so we understand it is work for them, but that we think it's worthwhile. I mean, I, you know, if I can just talk generation, generationally for a minute. Um, the people who are... Um, who probably mo find it easiest to do this would be seniors. And they love having younger people come to their house because their kids are not around, their grandkids live a thousand miles away, whatever. So I can think of a number of seniors in our church who have had international students in uh, for, for a meal. Um, the downside of that, and there's no downside, I shouldn't say that way, but the, the challenge of that is they are the ones that I have to, or that we have to work with the hardest in terms of cultural sensitivity. Um, they, they are the ones that will say the worst things sometimes. So that's what I would say is that often I have to have a discussion with them first of all and often in that discussion they will even with me say several things that I have to tell them are not true. Uh, to just get that off the table because they, this is a new thing for them. Uh, I would say um, the buster generation is pretty good at this. Um, again, they're getting at the stage now where their kids are getting grown up. So they don't have the same home responsibilities. Um, and they are more culturally attuned, I think, than my generation is. Um, I think, so then I will say, um, I have had, on several occasions, had young adults from other parts of the world say, um, why don't people our age uh, do things with us? So I think we need to get across to that younger group how meaningful it would be uh, for them to be hospitable, knowing that it will be hard, but their guests will realize how hard it is too and appreciate it all the more. And it's not going to be something they're going to do three days a week, I'm sure. Uh, but, but nevertheless, it would be meaningful. And frankly, I guess I'd all, I'd, I would also hope to get across to them how much of a blessing it would be to them and probably more than they ever realize. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, sure. On the same track, I'm wondering, um, thinking about different uh, generational groups or socioeconomic groups or folks who are new Canadians, the invitation itself, are there nuances to having folks accept the invitation that Yeah.
So I'm, I'm, again, this is off the top of my head, so I'm just trying to think now of who has come. I can't think of a Muslim who's come to our house for the first time because we invited them. I think they've always been invited by another student. Um, that would not be true of Hindus. Hindus, even, even church, I mean, um, I had to laugh when, one Sunday morning I was going to the university to pick up students and uh, one of the Christian students when I got their text down said you know I can't get ready in time I'm not going today and so one of the women who had gotten into the car was was Hindu and she says oh she says these Christians she says I'm a Hindu and I go to church every week you know she just couldn't understand why this Christian would be going to church on Sunday and here she was um, because for them the, the faith community is a big deal. Like they, they are not, they haven't yet espoused Christianity, but they want to be in a place, uh, they want to be in a place of faith. Uh, even again, I think of a, a student, I sent out text one week and one student hadn't been, hadn't been to church very often. And uh, she wrote back right away and said, um, you know, after the week I've had, I really realize I need to be in church this Sunday. And again, she's Hindu. But she's saying, I need to be in church this Sunday. So those are, um, in terms of different religious groups, I think, uh, we, once we get to know Muslims, they would return when we invited them. But I, th I don't think we've ever had a Muslim come that we invited. It's always been somebody else said, would you come with us? And they've come with someone that they knew. Um, Well, I, again, I've, I've, we have had a Muslim and a Christian, just two people. So again, we, we actually we invited the Christian. She said, can I bring my roommate? And so the roommate was Muslim. And then after that, they were both in our home several times. So it might be, but I mean, again, I just say, I think the Muslims have always been in the minority. That would, uh, well, you know, the, the picture I showed from Christmas, there was one Muslim there. So, and he had a great time, as far as I could tell. Um, so I don't think that's the issue. I, I wonder if it's more the issue that if we invite them, it's seen as sort of an evangelistic ploy, whereas if their friends invite them, they see it as going to a Christmas party. You know, I don't know. I'm not sure. All right. I think we will come to a close. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, intentionality about media, but I don't think we'll go there after this. Um, so I think we'll stop there and uh, see you at 7 o'clock.